easy solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author and host of The Ken Coleman Show, where he talks about your careers and your jobs and anything we have to do with making money is... uh, is my co-host today as we're answering your questions about your life and your money. It is a free call at 888-825-5225. Bra- uh, and Andrea is with us in New Jersey. Hey, Andrea, what's up? Hi, Papa Dave. Hi, Mr. Coleman. How are you guys doing today? Great. How can we help? Um, so currently I'm a longshoreman, um, and I truly hate what I do. I started it last year. Before that, I worked for an urgent care, hated that too. Um, I think the only thing I really enjoyed most is dealing with people with disabilities. Um, it, it was a calling for me. I loved what I did, except there wasn't any money in that, so I had to kind of move along. Um, and I just don't like what I do. Like, I, I'm a people's person. I'm not with people at all. I'm in a machine, like, 42 feet in the air, and I just don't like it. So I just was wondering, should I search for a job that I love that pays more, or should I stay there to pay off debt? A job that you love that pays more? Correct. Yeah, well, it's but it's both and. You don't have to choose. So we stay Why would in you the... not get a job that pays more that you love? Of course you would do that. Well, the job that I work at now pays a lot. I get paid a lot, like 220000 a year. But it's long days. I work from 6 in the morning to 9 at night, uh, seven days a week. How much debt do you have? Um, about 35000 20 what? in student loans. Six in credit cards, Great. seven in medical bills. What's your payoff date? What, if everything stays um, the same, when are you going to be out of debt? So I should have been out of debt by next year. However, I got injured at work um, at the end of March. So I've been out on workers' comp, and workers' comp doesn't pay a lot. It's about 1400 every two weeks. When do you get back to a normal schedule? Uh, hopefully by October. And so the then end you of get, September. All right. Well, so you're you're posing the question of of should I stay where I am and pay off debt or do something I love and make really good money? And it's 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 not a choice. It's we want to get you out of debt, and while you're uh, looking for something that you love that you can make really good money in, that's going to take some time. That usually doesn't just appear on a tree somewhere. So we stay put, even though you don't love the longshoreman work. The fact of the matter is, you're making really good money. That's going to get you out of debt faster, get you into baby step three quicker, get that fully funded. So there's a timeline based on what you choose. So you got to get qualified, maybe, and then you got to get connected. You got to get started and get moving into this new new path. So stay put, get out of debt, keep working the baby steps while we are exploring and deciding and getting ready to make that transition. So but that's the overview. Here's the thing. You're... Okay. Um, your level of frustration at work will go down dramatically the harder you work on your exit. Okay. If you just sit around and fume and run the crane, you're just going to fume, right? Correct. And, but if you are actively going, okay, I got, I, I figured it out. There's 17 steps to get where I want to go. That's a pain in the butt, but I'm going to start working those 17 steps and I can do some of those from this crane and I can do some of them after I save up a hundred thousand dollars after I get out of debt and quit uh, or whatever, but at least developing a plan, the not knowing and the ambivalence is much more stressful than even a hard path. Correct. And so I the, think that's more so what it is, is that I don't know what I want to do. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. So you aren't clear, and so you're frustrated. So what we got to do is get you clear. I think the clues for you are the work that you absolutely loved before, but now expand your ideas and a vision beyond what it really was. So you loved working with people. Specifically, they had some, was it physical or mental disabilities? Is that what you Both. mentioned? Both. Both. So why? So getting to the why, and I'll just put you on the spot really quick. What was so rewarding about serving that particular people group? Um, it was just helping them. They didn't have a, like a, they. I was able to give them a voice that they didn't have. Um, so it was. I don't know. It was just helping, like helping. No, with you the nailed it. Aspect. You just nailed it. That was beautiful. Don't forget that. I'm going to give it to you one word. 
okay? I think it's the advocacy side. You are sticking up for, standing in the gap for somebody, a people group that most people aren't standing up for, and that's what drew you to that work. Does that sound about right? Yes. Yeah. Actually, it does, 100%. Okay, now good. So here's the deal. So that's a clue that we're going to start with. So now we go up from there and we go, all right, that's the baseline. I need to be in a role where I'm advocating for people who don't have a voice. I want to be the voice of the voiceless. So how do I make $200,000 and more eventually? This is the framework here. So I've got to say, okay, who uh, who are the people that I want to be the voice for? Let's start to get some sp- some some special groups that you go, okay, well, it's over here. Maybe it's the mental disabilities, physical disabilities. Maybe it's somebody else, another people group that you feel drawn to. And you go, who's helping them now? So we start to go look into that world. Who's serving that people group? It, nonprofits, for-profit, what's it look like? Products, services, what is the whole universe like around this type of advocacy work and now you begin to see well there's this professional path there's this one and it goes on from there are you still tracking with me andrea i am definitely tracking so now you begin to see things you haven't seen before and so then you're going to sit down and talk with people who are winning in that space that are making really good money in that product or service lane okay and we find Mm -hmm. out what it looks like day in and day out this is called clarify and verify and then as we pick something we okay now it's going to take this much uh, certification or some type of education, depending on what's required. It's going to take this level of experience. And so to Dave's point, you may be in that crane for a while to save up, to put yourself in a position to then go down but it this won't, path. It won't seem like long. It won't. Because you because it's part of the plan then, rather than just okay. a place to fume. Okay. So what happened, so let me much. just tell you, at, you're an advocate or a, uh, a crusader. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so 30 years ago, a bunch of banks crapped on me. And I spent the next 30 years pissing them off. And taking, up, and, ta- <laughs> and taking up for the little guy. Mm-hmm. So I'm a crusader. It's what I do. I'm an advocate. It's what I do for people that regular people that never even stopped and thought that the bank is screwing them. Never even thought that Bank of America and SoFi are actually filthy, dirty words. They never even thought about it. And so we started putting that in their brain and showing them how. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be something as, uh, in other words, a crusader or an advocate isn't necessarily someone who simply helps somebody in and out of a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It could be a much bigger thing than that single act. As a matter of fact, it should be. I don't just sit and do budgets one-on-one with people anymore, but that's where I started. That's right. And so um, we can take you there. Hang on. We're going to give you a copy of Ken's book, Paycheck to Purpose, and also a copy of the assessment to take to help you uh, get clear on where you're going. But I think we got a good head start on it. Hey, I'm proud of you. Yes. You're a neat lady. Get after it, girl. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit. Whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com.
Ed Coleman Ramsey, personality number one best-selling author of the book Paycheck to Purpose, is my co-host today. Have you ever found yourself saying one day, one day I'll be able to buy a house, one day I'll be happy in my career, one day I won't have to battle with anxiety, one day I'll get my debt paid off. Hey, listen, you're not going to do anything when you start saying that. That just that's kicking the can. That's all that is. You got to stop waiting around. Whatever your one day is, you got to start. That's why we created Smart Conference. It is oddly enough a one day event where we tackle all areas of your life and help you get moving along. Let's get some traction. Let's face it, we could all use that kind of a boost. And you hear from some of the nation's top thought leaders and best selling authors on each of the subjects career, mental health, money, relationships marriage, leadership. This event is hitting the road and will be coming to Dallas. These are my best speakers, the best people I know to bring. I'll be sitting in the audience and speaking when Rachel Cruz, my own daughter, number one best-selling author, many times over will be speaking. Dr. John Deloney, number one best-selling author, speaking on mental health and mental wellness. Ken Coleman, sitting to my right right now, number one best-selling author, will be speaking on career. Our hottest new Ramsey personalities, George Campbell, Christina Ellis, and the space of money. I'm going to be there speaking. And my friends, Craig and Amy Groeschel, pastors at Life Church in Oklahoma City, one of the largest churches in America, will be speaking on marriage. So every subject is covered by some of the best speakers, communicators, thought leaders in these spaces. It's, a, it's the kind of information you need and a whole day of it i mean you're gonna it's like drinking from a fire hose you know go up to a water fountain to get a drink somebody turns on a fire hose that's where you're gonna go home emotionally tired from learning this much in one day and it's only 39 dollars for the day because the vip and platinum are already sold out the event is almost sold out it's august 20 october 22nd almost had it over there october 22nd saturday all day long in dallas texas go to ramseysolutions.com slash events and get your event passes immediately if not sooner this is the thing to do get her done right now open phones at 888-825-5225 elizabeth is in birmingham hi elizabeth how are you hi dave hi ken thank you so much for taking my call sure what's up well, my husband and I actually filed for Chapter 13 bankruptcy uh, back in May. And guys, this is a decision that we are regretting right now. Um, at the time, just long story short, we were in a, a bad financial place earlier this year. I had lost my job. And so um, we were working the baby steps. We were on baby step number two when all this happened. And I think in a panic of realizing that we were down to one income, um, we panicked and um, did some stupid things and got into more debt and then realized that, hey, uh, we got to pay this off. How are we going to do it? We weren't looking at the bigger picture, and so we filed for Chapter 13. Mm. And fast forward to today, we're in a much better place. Uh, I have a great job. My husband's doing well. Mm -hmm. And, guys, we do well every month except that pest payment that we have is really cutting into our monthly income and we were we're in gazelle mode right now we're selling everything that we can sell we had a yard sale and we're doing good and they're bringing in extra money but in bankruptcy you can't you know you get that payment and you got to stick with it and we are actually we have an appointment with our bankruptcy attorney later this week to actually see about just getting out of bankruptcy just canceling it all together and uh, taking on the task ourselves, and we would love to get y'all's opinion on uh, whether you think we should do this or just keep at it with Chapter 13. Okay. Uh, well, first, let's establish a couple of things. Once the uh, file has been opened on you at the courthouse, that's where the th phrase comes from, filing bankruptcy. And a, a number has been assigned to you, so you have filed bankruptcy. You cannot unfile bankruptcy. You can voluntarily dismiss a Chapter 13, but if anyone ever asks the question, have you ever filed bankruptcy, the answer for the rest of your life is yes. Okay. Me too, by the way. Yes. <laughs> okay. I filed Chapter 7 in 1988. So, right. me too. Been there, done that. Uh, and seven's a lot worse than 13. So... Uh, but, but that's really a misnomer because right now what you're asking about is the cash flow and what kind of risk and stuff have you got? So what kind of debts do you have? Our biggest one, guys, we have two car payments. 
and um, that what our cars were, we owe more on them than they were worth at the time. Now, since we filed, I don't really know the standing. Uh, we also had about 25000 in credit card debt and about 6000 in personal loans, uh, no student loans, and that's all we have at this time. Okay, and what do you owe on the two cars? Uh, the two cars right around uh, probably $30,000 each. Okay, and um, you think they're worth somewhere in that vicinity? Uh, probably a little bit less, um, probably around, I think we could, in a, it may be more just depending on how the, the market is right mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. Uh, but I would say, Dave, probably around twenty six or 27000 at least. Okay, all right. Um, and, and so what do you guys make now? What's your household income now? Uh, our household income per month net after health insurance taxes and all that, we're looking right around $5,100 a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the bankruptcy is running. Now, what's what's taking, your house payment? Uh, our, we rent and our payment is 1400 a month. Okay. All right. So the way you can kind of analyze this is, um, Pretend like you took a um, a baseball bat and you hit a hornet's nest and you threw the hornet's <laughs> nest in a closet and closed okay. the door. Okay? You're yes, getting sir. ready to open the door. Oh, Lord. <laughs> All okay. of these people are not mildly pissed. They're going to come after you with everything they got, and you got to have a plan okay. for taking care of every one of them if you're going to open the okay. door. Okay. okay. So you need more information on the cars. Can you get out of these cars? Because you probably need to sell both of them. Uh, yes, sir. We can. Uh, we've actually got a little bit of uh, money from just the gazelle intent of selling everything stashed aside to mm-hmm. where if we needed to pay the difference, we could. And and then you're going to get something to drive for cash. Uh, yes, sir. We'll have okay. to. What was we'll the 6000 The 25000 was credit card debt and the 6000 was what? Uh, personal loans. Okay. To who? Uh, let's say uh, just lenders in general, um, oh, audio per- credit. Was like personal lines of, of credit. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. They're going to be the worst versus credit cards. Okay. Because they're basically bottom feeders. <laughs> and they're, they're, okay. they're, they're going to come after you um, really, really aggressively. So you're going to knock those out really, really fast. The credit card companies are um, – incompetent inefficient so the uh how how aggressively they chase you will take them time Uh, during that time you need to just be on the phone with one at a time of them and get a payment plan going okay if you just start paying them payments most of the time you 99 percent of the time you shut them up okay 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 but you you can't just ignore them because now they've got, you've got no protection. Because federal bankruptcy filing puts a stay, an injunction, like telling a dog, stay, uh, mm-hmm. on all of the creditors. They can't touch you. They're the hornets in the closet with the door closed. When you right. voluntarily dismiss, you open the door. And right. out come all the hornets. So you need, yes. a, you, need, you, need, you need a bug spray. You need uh, fly swatter. You need uh, okay. a, a hood with, you know, on your head or whatever it is, whatever metaphor we want to do here to keep all this crap <laughs> from getting at you, right? And so, yes, yeah, go ahead and dumping the cars uh, and so forth. All of that will work. Uh, by the way, inside the Chapter 13, you can probably get the trustee's permission to do the car deals. Okay. And dump the car okay. deals and get your cars all situated. And, you know, pay the payment for one or two more months. All of the payments you're paying is going towards your debts anyway. You're not losing any money by paying payments because you're going to be paying payments after you come out of this. So you're you're still going to have payments, and there's still going to be a bunch of them. Um, You just want to make sure you got a plan. But I'm with you. If you can step out of that 13, you probably can manage it more efficiently than you can inside the 13 if you're willing to dump these cars especially. Wow. Lesson learned. Bankruptcy is not something you do impulsively because I'm scared. This is The Ramsey Show. Look, I love real estate, and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. 
That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership, and Church Hill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey, to start your approval or get more information. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, host of The Ken Coleman Show, is my co-host today. In Phoenix, Arizona, Chris and Andrea are where this says on my screen, you guys are debt-free. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, we are. We are officially, completely, 100% never going back into debt-free. I love it. I love it. How much did you pay off? So we paid off the mortgage. That took us uh, about 10 years. It was about 211000 But altogether, from when we first picked up the total money makeover in 2011 to now, it's uh, $267,631. I love it. And uh, what was your range of income during that 10-year period? We ranged between 150 and 250 Cool. What do you all do for a living? Well, I uh, am a former TV news anchor here in Phoenix, Arizona. And I left uh, in 2018, but that was uh, my career path for many, many years, almost 15 years. And I'm a firefighter in Phoenix. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So, Andrea, do I know you? Yes, we do. Of yes, course we, we do. do. I thought you so. You know Chris, too. In fact, we were uh, we visited you as well in 2019, not that long ago. Okay. I thought that was you guys. All right. Yep. Well, congratulations, you guys. Way to go. You did it. What's this house worth? We just yeah. looked it up the other day. It was six hundred and seventy thousand. Which is wow. love it. How much in the retirement plans? Uh, re just over eight hundred thousand. Ah, baby steps, millionaires. How old are you two? So that was our thing. Is I we had this goal in twenty eleven that we would be debt free before Andrea turns forty. She's a little bit older than me. Just a couple <laughs> months. Oh wow, months brave guy. Forty. So thirty nine, and then she's now forty. All right. And your baby steps millionaires. I love it. Yeah, he is a brave guy. He runs into burning buildings and he just called his wife old. You know? I know. Yeah. This is guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more wise, actually. <laughs> Whoa. Quick around there. Uh -huh. Way to go, you two. Okay. So tell us what started your whole Ramsey journey 10 years ago. So we were, we were just normal. We were normal Americans, uh, student loan debt, credit card debt, car debt. And it just seemed like no matter how hard we tried, we just kept falling further and further behind. And I remember driving down the freeway to go to the fire station and uh, used to have this in Phoenix. You had this billboard that said, act your wage, and you were cutting up a credit card. And I thought, what does that mean? So I found your book, and we went through that that total money makeover book and started teaching FPU. And it was just it, like it changed our lives. It changed the way we looked at money. And uh, so that was kind of, I think, the seed we planted. And then we got on the same page as well. We started kind of, um, you know, looking at our future and deciding how we wanted to look and how we wanted to raise kids and what we wanted to teach them. And um, and then also started buying, uh, stopped buying things that we uh, couldn't afford and oh. justified it with, you know, we deserved it. We made good money. We yeah. work hard. You know, the whole story that we all tell ourselves and how we all end up getting into debt. Sure. But now with 1.4 million and you're not even 40, you don't have to get up at three o'clock in the morning anymore. No, I don't. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the, I mean, if it wasn't, Dave, it wasn't for finding you. I mean, obviously your, your plan, your book, your, your ministry that you, you do for all of us, it's, if it wasn't for finding you, there, there's so many things that happened along the way that we could have never imagined. Like when the kids got older and Andrea's thinking, you know, I get up at 2.45 in the morning, I never see them, because we had no debt and because we had a giant emergency fund, 
she was able to walk away from her job. It was, it was little things along the way that happened that we didn't, like our goal was always to be debt free, but there were so many wins along the way by just, you know, not doing stupid things with money. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you listening or watching, a lot of folks don't realize if you turn on your television at six in the morning and someone is there and bright and chipper and cheery, it's because they've been up since three. <laughs> yeah. 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 2.30 is when I woke up, uh, 15 years of that, Monday through Friday, and I we were just talking about this the other day. I thought, I, well, actually, we were talking about it last night. We had a real late flight getting in. We were on a vacation, and I said, I used to wake up at this time. What in the world? How did I do that for so long? But, you know, you do what you have to do for a while, and now we're well past that, and, uh, you know, life looks better than I think we ever could have imagined it. Yeah, you know, I'm going to turn that uh, statement, uh, that question into a question for you. Tell folks, how do you stay in it for 10 years to pay your house off? What kept you guys going? Because now you're on the other side of it. You know, I there were there were so many days that were hard, I will say, but we were so we were such a team and we could not have done this if either of us were on a different page. And so I think we just kept that goal of one day we'll, you know, have a paid off house. One day we won't be making decisions, um, you know, based on, oh, well, we have to do this job or I have to work here because we have, you know, X, Y, Z um, to pay off. And so we just stayed so focused on that. And some days it was so hard, you know, people would make fun of us and, you know, I, we still drive old cars, but they're nice cars. They're just old. Um, and, you know, now it's just it's such a way of life. Like, I could never imagine living the way we used to live ever again. Amen. The freedom we feel today, nothing can take that away. Yeah, yeah. Way to go, you guys. I'm so proud of you. Man, what a wonderful like a moment. We've, I've been dreaming about this. I've been listening to your show for 10 years. And every time I have, like, I hear somebody on the radio doing their debt free scream, I would send it to Andrea and be like, hey, this is going to be us in, you know, X amount of years or whatever. And it's just, it's just kind of sitting in this moment right now. I'm like, I cannot believe we're actually on, but we're doing our debt free scream. I just, it's just and surreal. It's so surreal. And I will say, I got to just add this in here because we have really sat in this the last like month or so since, you know, officially paying off the mortgage. And I told Chris the other day, I said, you know, God, man, he's so good. I said, his math, though, it does not make sense to me because what we paid off in the last um, year, you know, our income has changed significantly with me leaving work. But for some amazing reason, like, uh, he's just amazing because it doesn't add up. What we paid for the principal and how much we were able to pay off in the last year with having less of an income um, – but, man, when you're faithful and you just keep stewarding it the way we're supposed to steward it and you stay so focused on his way over your way, like, everything changes for the better. Money changes, relationships change, everything gets better. Amen. Amen. It's a different economy than the uh, standard math, for sure. <laughs> yes, and it's a better economy, way my better. goodness. Amen. Amen. Well, so proud of you, too. Very, very cool. It's good to hear from you, too. Copy of Baby Steps Millionaire is coming your way since you are officially one. Uh, and a copy of a uh, one-year subscription or uh, membership to Financial Peace University. I know you've already been through it, but these are things you can give away and help somebody along the way as you keep talking about having one with this. It's not bragging. Uh, it is testifying. There's a difference. And so also a copy Total Money Makeover for you to give away to somebody. So we're going to give you lots of stuff there to help you out. And just to say we're proud of you. Congratulations my friends very 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 well done chris and andrea phoenix arizona 211 no 267 thousand total paid off a little over 10 years house and everything baby steps millionaires before they're 40 making 150 to 250 count it down let's hear a debt-free scream ready yeah three two one we're debt-free This is how it's done. Whoop, whoop. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. See, uh, Ken, you know this, uh, our, our listeners don't, but you and I and the other Ramsey personalities, we have the pleasure of being in studio with a lot of television personalities on the national scale. 
our friends up at Fox, for instance, and uh, lots of the cities that we go into will be in Phoenix in a few weeks and be doing television there while we're there and hanging out with people and getting, you know, we, we because I've been going into that studio off and on for 20 years, I end up making friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the uh, honestly, the funny thing is, I mean, your cameraman, your audio guy, mm -hmm. our gal, uh, the lady calling the shots and, you know, calling the camera shots and the uh, anchor in front of you uh it's not unusual at all for one of them to start following the stuff we teach and then they'll give you an update when i when we drop by there the next year or two hey man i did it i've been working here for two years i got out of debt and uh some of these folks we've struck up friendships with over the years and chris and andrea are on that list i'm so proud of you guys very 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 well done this is the ramsey show Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Cindy's in Baton Rouge. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Hi, Dave. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, we have, my husband and I have 460000 in a money market type account, and then we have 135000 in cash. And we're to the point of saying, what do we do with this? We're not making any profit on most of that money. And um, we took the 460 out of equities and securities because we were losing a lot of money in that. And uh, that money had come from a home that we sold. And because we got an interest rate of 2.5 on a new home, uh, we went with the 2.5 and put the 460 into securities and equities and uh, didn't want to lose it beyond what we put in there. So we put it in the money market. Parking. Mm -hmm. What do you owe on your home? 366k. Okay. Um from 30 years of coaching people how to become wealthy and from doing uh, a study of 10,000 millionaires, these are the two sources for my data that tells me the shortest distance between where you are and wealth is two things as a um consistently funded 401k Roth IRA in good growth stock mutual funds over a long period of time that becomes some money and a paid for house. Our last debt free scream was a $600,000 uh, paid for house and $800,000 in their 401k or reverse. I forget which, but it was $1.4 million net worth. And it was just a few moments ago while you were on hold, you heard it. Yes. Okay. So that is the typical path that we see that is the most often used by people who become millionaires. Now, where does that take us in your situation? It says I would pay off my house today. Because here's what you ended up doing. It wasn't the start of your plan, but the net result of your plan is you borrowed money at 2.35% and invested it at a half a percent. Right? Yes, sir. We were... I know that wasn't where you, that wasn't what you set out to do, but that's where you ended up, isn't it? It is. I pay off my house today, advisor. today, <laughs> by close of business today, write a check. Okay. Okay. And now you don't have any house payment anymore. How's that feel? Awesome. Because now, I want to retire. <laughs> yeah. And now you got $200,000 in cash that we got to do something better than a stupid money market account with. You need an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses for your short-term emergencies. And, um, I mean, 
you know, let's call that 50 grand at your house for the fun of it. You've still got 150,000 that you need to do something with other than a stupid butt savings account. Now, if you put it into some kind of a mix with a stockbroker and you were losing money, I get that. If you put it into good mutual funds and the overall economy slowed down like it is right now and the value went down, then you didn't have somebody good in your corner to coach you and say, hey, the only person gets hurt on a roller coaster is those that jump off in the middle of the ride, which is exactly what you did. Now, were you mm-hmm. invested in single stocks? No. You're in we mutual were funds. Very diversified. In mutual funds. Some of them were in mutual funds. Okay. Well, what I would do is sit down with a good investment broker, and here's what you're looking for this time. Um. And uh, you're looking for someone with the heart of a teacher that teaches you the history of the mutual fund that you're putting the money into. Okay, I'll give you an example. I own one that's over 80 years old. In the 80 years it's been open, fewer than 15 of the those 80 years has have been a down year. So if we happen to have a down year, and I know that, I know that. Not my broker knows that, but I know that then I'm not freaking out. It's kind of like the house that you own in Baton Rouge. If it went down in value this year, you wouldn't freak out because generally speaking, homes in the neighborhood you live in for the past 40 years have gone up in value. Agreed? Agreed. So you wouldn't freak out on one down year and bail out. That's just like that mutual fund I'm describing. I'm not going to freak out in one down year and bail out. But that's all knowledge on your part rather than depending on someone else to tell you what to do and then you get scared because you watch the news. And you never take financial advice from the news. If the commercial breaks where you're watching TV are walk-in bathtubs, gold commercials, and reverse mortgages and Snuggies, that tells you you don't want to take financial advice there. That's just a bad plan. And so uh, here's me looking at you, Fox. But anyway, yeah, so there you go. But the uh, Fox business, right? But uh, I love them. They're wonderful. But the commercials are comical. Saturday Night Live. I'm trying so hard. I I can't hold it in. You're not saying walking bathtubs are a bad idea. (laughs) Just the investment advice. (laughs) I'm just saying if this is where you get your investment advice. I know what you're saying. When the commercial breaks are walk-in bathtubs and snuggies, then you know you're not getting good. This is this is a bad place. Oh, that was perfect. I'm sorry. That just got me. That was like the church giggle. I couldn't hold it well, any longer. I mean, we've all sat and watched them at the commercial I know breaks, exactly. Right? I know exactly what you you're know, talking so, about. But the, yeah, the, <laughs> and, and we're on there giving financial advice, so what do we know? But anyway, the, uh, uh, but, you, know, you really need to sit with a good broker who has the heart of a teacher. Go to RamseySolutions.com, click on Smart Vester, sit down with them, interview them, and what you're looking for here is, is a type of wisdom not intellect. There's a difference. There's a lot of very, very intellectual ignoramuses out there. And that's not in the world in in general. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking for common sense wisdom that says, I bought a mutual fund that for 80 years has only had less than 15 down years. So we're having a down year. I don't need to panic. And that you learn that you internalize that you emotionally swallow that. And then it becomes part of your plan. And so in that situation, then you invest in good mutual funds in your 401ks and your Roth IRAs and those kinds of things, and you get your house paid for. And that's what I'm going to do with your 150, unless you've got other debts, and then I'm going to clean that up too. So I want you debt-free 100% and investing in good growth stock mutual funds. That is the shortest path, that have long track records, that are comfortable to you, and that you understand what's going on. You didn't do it because I said do it or because some goob at a financial office said do it. It's because you learned, and your knowledge allows you to sleep at night. You know, Ken, that's the difference between tossing and turning at night Mm -hmm. when the stock market's down. Yeah is whether you made the decision based on knowledge you had mm-hmm. or knowledge someone else had. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, for years, I mean, before I even started working with you, this idea, the roller coaster analogy that you've given, and it's really true. When you look at the data, uh, if you look over the last 30 years, you just got to stay calm and ride this thing out. And I just don't freak out when I see the stock market dip. You know, I say, hey, we keep investing. That's an opportunity. It's going to come back. And, and you're right. Knowledge uh, is what gives us tremendous confidence and confidence the peace. Yeah. And once you really understand that, folks, about the stock market, then when it goes down, you kind of go like, 
it's on sale. Yeah, we're getting bargain right it's now. It's a bargain time. Yep. This is the time to buy. Well, we don't really do that either because I'm not going to tell you to time the market. I'm just going to tell you steady invest. Mm -hmm. Steady invest. That's all I have done. I have been tempted at times when the market is down to time it. Yeah. I really, really wish hmm. in 2008 when uh -oh. the stock market was crashing and the world's coming to an end and it went from 13000 to 6500 I really wish I had put an extra million dollars in. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, the Dow's sitting at, what, 6X of that. That million wow. today would be worth $6 million. Wow. Because the Dow's, you know, 30000 over 30000 right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's 5X, 5X of yeah. that. Yeah. It'd be worth $5 million. Now, ultimately, I did have money in there, and it's worth 5X. But if you could have timed the market and bought at the po lowest possible time we've seen in decades, then that would have been the time to do it. But who knew when the bottom was? Hmm. If I had bought at 6500 it would have gone to 6000 <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a I'd chance, been, yeah. Then I'd have been pissed I missed the bottom. Not mm. that I was going to lose money, but because I missed the bottom. So don't try to time the market. People trying to time the market don't win. They really don't. And jumping in and out based on what you hear on the news, based on whether or not Russia invades Ukraine, is really a bad idea. You've got to have a long-term scope on this stuff and ride it out. And that includes having your house paid off, Cindy. So thank you for calling. We appreciate you being in our audience. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? It's your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they really love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, host of the Ken Coleman Show, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today. And uh, he, of course, specializes on your career and your jobs, and so taking your calls about that subject as well today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Matt starts off this hour in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. So cool to be on. Um, I'll jump right into it. So I've, me and my wife are working the baby steps with great success. Um, I've got a good job. I make decent money. Um, I've got some of the best reasons anyone could ask for to get up and go to work every morning, but I still find myself struggling pretty frequently with um, finding meaning and fulfillment in my career. I don't think a shift in careers is the answer. I think I'm, you know, with the right circumstances, I could feel the same way with any kind of job. So I would love your perspective and your input on recommendations on things that I could do or book recommendations to help kind of pivot my perspective and start looking for meaning in my everyday so if i heard you right you're looking for meaning but you're you don't think you don't think it's a, a move in uh professional occupation is that what i heard maybe one day but at this moment my current career makes the most sense as a vehicle to reach financial peace for for me and my family okay well so that's a little bit different focus then instead of what you're doing um you need to be focused on what you're producing so what do you do I do heating and air. Heating and air. So you're out there uh, working on HVAC systems? Yep. Okay, great. So if, if based on what you just said, I want to challenge you in a moment on the big picture. But if, if I'm looking for meaning, um, I'm going to be focusing on the relief on men and women's faces when you show up to fix the AC. I mean, I'm telling you, if you're showing up to fix AC in Atlanta in August uh, and, and a lady answers the door, believe me, you're more important than her husband at that very moment. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Well, well in, in the rare scenario, yes. But these last couple of years, what I've been noticing is that smiling face is becoming 
uh, much more scarce, and the the frustrated, pent up, just uh-huh. the anger seems to be much more common in in my personal experience. And I understand that, and I and I don't dispute that. But my point that I was making there, a little, a little humorous take, is is that you've got to focus on you are providing uh, emotional relief. Yes, they're 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 upset at a lot of things in life, and certainly because their machine isn't working or whatever. But you are providing emotional relief. You are providing uh, comfort for for people to sleep at night there's a lot going on there and i think that's what you have to focus in on and and you have to say you know what right now uh, my job is to uh come and uh fix a problem but more importantly do it in a way uh where people do appreciate the service that i've brought them even if they're not super kind and super nice about how they treat you uh, based on what you've told me that's what you have to focus on is what's at the other end of your work and at the other end of your work is peace of mind and comfort and let's be honest safety if we're talking about heating in a very cold you know environment so that's what you're focusing on and then you're grateful for the job uh and what it's doing for you and paying off debt uh giving you stability to do that so gratitude on one end for the job and then uh, appreciation for what you are ultimately providing now, okay. um, yeah. why, uh, I mean, if you're on time and your company's not overcharging, there shouldn't be really any anger directed at you, just frustration that they're heating airs out. Yeah, it's not necessarily at me. I think it's just the, the last couple of years have been a little wild, and I think I'm noticing that wear on people's nerves more and more, and unfortunately, sometimes I'm the target of that, if that makes sense, just because I'm there and they're already in a frustrating situation. Um, yeah. can, can, if I could ask you, what would be, if I catch myself in a moment and I'm just frustrated and worn out or, or, or whatever, and I'm struggling to, to feel grateful, what would be an exercise you would recommend? I kind of put myself through to, to reset myself, I guess. Yeah. Well, you got to go right back to, Hey, um, I've been able to pay off this amount of debt. Uh, we're going to be out of the baby step two at this such and such a time. Uh, this is providing this for my family. You just, you retreat back to what this job, uh, is allowing you to be able to do. And so it's not really fancy. It's just retreat to clarity. I'm clear on what I'm grateful for. And I know that this is just the season that I'm in. It's not a sentence. It's a season big difference. And I think that's all you can do in those moments. But I, I would really challenge you. I'm just curious. Let's fast forward because uh, I know you've thought about it. Uh, what, what, what would you do long term if all this debt was gone and the emergency fund was fully stocked and you had options? What would you do? Well, that's, that's, that's kind of a, a struggle. Um, so it, I would love to, to write a book. That's my, that's my dream eventually. Um, it's, I just don't have tons of time to, to work on that day to day right now. That's fine. Um, but, but where, where I find myself kind of battling internally is I'm, I think I'm, I'm above average in pretty much anything that I apply myself to, but I have no idea what I would actually be great at. Does that make sense? I don't know what my specific niche skills are. Sure. I, don't know. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. And I'm going to give you my get clear assessment, which will help you have some self-awareness and then get feedback from people. But when I encounter someone who says that, um, that's a person who, for some reason, uh, has some self doubt. And I think the people who know you best, maybe, maybe you're one of your favorite coaches or teachers, uh, or coworkers. I'd be asking the question and in your wife, uh, family members who are going to be honest with you, you know, what you're above average in and, and just say, am I above average? You see me that way and where you're above average, see that can be turned into greatness. So that's real talent that can be honed. Think of talent as like a, a ball of clay. And when the potter puts uh, the pressure of his hands and the water on it, it's shaped into something tremendously useful. So that above average, that is what you're talented in. And then applying education, applying practice and experience to that talent, that can become a super skill. So stop wondering so much. Get some verification, confirmation from people who know you well. Use the Get Clear assessment I'm going to give you. And it is in those talents where you're going to see clues to enjoyment, to work that you enjoy doing. So Hang on, I want to give you uh, not just the Get Clear assessment, which will give you a great report on talent, what you do best, passion, what you love, and mission, what motivates you. See, those three things are vital for someone to get clear and then make really, really good money and tremendous impact. I'll give you the book from Paycheck to Purpose as well, which is the map 
that'll help you climb up the mountain once you determine what is that long term that dream that peak that you want to scale and i on the short term i don't know how much control you've got over the situation but um we're in a business where sometimes people are stressed out too they're freaked out they got money problems and sometimes they want to transfer their frustration to one of our team members and we just tell them they're not allowed to do that um we're not here to be abused we're here to help you and it's not customer service to be abused that's just lack of boundaries and so if you got somebody that's out of control uh, you may need to deselect them as a customer like fire them as a customer this is the ramsey show Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper, Jumpstart Your CFO Career. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Have you heard the news? We're in a recession. Stock market's falling. Inflation's out of control. It's pretty easy to get out of control yourself, isn't it? If you watch the news all day long, it'll put you in a rubber room, man. I mean, seriously. Yes, there's some real stuff out there, but this is not time to panic. And if you're investing, it's definitely not time to panic. You got to stay level-headed. You don't jump off the investing roller coaster in the middle of the ride. That's the only people get hurt. So uh, you got to watch out for the gloom and doom people. They're out there. And history shows that the economy recovers time and time and time again. So you got to have somebody to guide you through these times when you're investing. And that's why we have the Smart Vester program. The Smart Vesters, Smart Vester Pros don't work for us. They're people that we recommend that are in the financial advice business, and they help you with your investments with the heart of a teacher, meaning they're going to teach you what you're getting into. You're going to know what you're getting into, and you're going to want to stay through downturns. As a matter of fact, once you really understand a downturn, you're almost going to be tempted to invest more at downturns. RamseySolutions.com slash Smart Vester. If you want someone on your team to show you how and what is going on, RamseySolutions.com slash SmartVestor. Garrett is in Las Vegas. Hi, Garrett. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Ken. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Hey, so my question is, where do unexpected home repairs fall into baby step two? Emergencies. Okay, so let's say that the emergency fund is, is it an emergency? Mm, I'd probably say it's not an emergency. Then you don't do it in baby step two. Got it. So we wouldn't treat it like a an emergency if it's not. Actually. Okay, because uh, basically. Um, it, it, we, it's a bathroom and our kitchen kind of got shut down because of a leak. Well, you got to fix the leak. Um, well, the leak is fixed, but the insurance didn't cover the cost of the total repair. 
So essentially, we're just down a bathroom now. So it's just like essentially, they said it's going to be seven thousand dollars to fix the rest of the bathroom. So uh, I don't uh, know uh, I'm just, sorry. Stop. They, stop. 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 The toilet repair costs seven thousand dollars. No, the bathroom. It's the whole bathroom. Okay, what's wrong with the bathroom? So um, we had a leak that went unnoticed uh -huh. um, for about six months. Uh, Murphy's Law. We bought our house last year, uh -huh. and uh, we didn't notice it was coming from our master bathroom into the kitchen. And it basically, we noticed it when the floors were essentially uh, starting to, you know, cave in a little bit, and. Um, Obviously, with mold remediation and um, repair, um, pretty much the insurance only covered to a certain amount. So it covered, like, the cost of the kitchen and the demolition of the bathroom. But it pretty much, like, almost all the walls are, like, down in the bathroom and then no shower. And pretty much the whole thing is, you know, going to cost $7,000. So I didn't know if we would save something no, to um, pay for that before you, you need to just, you got to classify this need, whether this is an emergency or whether it isn't. So I don't understand why the insurance didn't cover the entire repair. Uh, because the limit on the um, hidden water leak oh. was only a 10,000. Yeah, I got you. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So um, how many bathrooms so do you have? Uh, well, it's a three bed, two bath. And so you have one bath operating. Correct. And you have how many people? Two. You Three and your wife. wife. Yes. Okay. And what's your household income? Uh, we met one ten. And what's your debt that you have remaining? Uh, Sixty nine thousand. Okay. It's going to take you two years. Okay. To get out of debt, right? Yes. Roughly. I mean, 18 months to two years, if you're really hardcore mm -hmm. on this. It's not, it shouldn't take you longer than two years. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, the, the way I try to answer questions on the show is, what would I do if I woke up in your shoes? Okay. What do you owe this 69000 on? Uh, well, uh, 31000 roughly spread over... Um, two cars, um, twenty eight thousand in credit card, and about ten thousand in student loan. Mm -hmm. And what is the most expensive car? The most expensive car. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so the most expensive car is going to be like my off roading slash overlanding vehicle, and that uh, that's like nineteen thousand. Okay. All right. Um, would you trade that for a bathroom? Absolutely would. Really? Absolutely would. Because I might not. Okay. Um, anyway, here's the way I answer questions. It, what would I do if I woke up in your shoes? You have a bathroom. It's just the two of you. This is an adventure. Let the stupid thing sit and get yourself out of debt. That's what Sharon and I would do if we woke up in your shoes. Now, if I wanted to get out of debt a little bit faster because the bathroom um, is a big deal, the second bathroom, uh, when we have one couple living in the house, um, I mean, I want you to get the stupid thing fixed, obviously, but it, you know, if you want to speed it up, the way you speed it up is you start selling off the expensive cars, and that speeds up how fast you get out of debt, right? Yes. Because one-third of your debt or one-fourth of your debt is one car. That's true. And boom, you know, we just cut down your two years to, uh, you know, a year and maybe 14 months or something like that. Uh, and you can knock the rest of this out if you want to. Now, really what that buys you is um, almost a year of fighting this stuff and waiting on to fix your $7,000 bath. But no, I would not budget in a non-emergency, non-leaking. You do have indoor plumbing. You have a bath. Um Sounds like a little creepy of a situation, but I'm with you. Our roof was leaking when we were broke, and we decided we were going to live this way. I got some of that black tar stuff in a five-gallon bucket and smeared it around on the roof and stopped the water from running down the light fixture onto the kitchen table. It looked like crap, 
but I could not afford a $6,000 roof at the time. And that's what it took to put a roof on that house. And uh, we lived like that for two years while we got out of debt. And after we got out of debt, I put a new roof on the house with cash because I don't borrow money anymore. And I wasn't going to stop getting out of debt for that one place that it was leaking and couldn't figure it out, a cheap way to do it. So I just made a mess. Yeah, I, I completely agree. A couple, one couple, no kids, one fully functioning bathroom. Take care of your priorities. It's not that big of a deal. It's a great story to tell anyway. You yeah. know, all your friends and family already know about it anyway because of the ordeal you've been through. Yeah. And you kind of, you know, someday when you have kids, you can go, you know, back in our 22, we lived <laughs> with one bathroom. Yeah. You know, you can tell the grandkids that, right? What did you call that stuff you put on the roof? What was that? Black? What was it? Tar. 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 Yeah. Whatever, uh, you, whatever you call it. Well, no, the reason I said it is because I recently had a I recently had a leak in my roof, which you know about, and I just didn't have time to get anybody out there, and so I waited until it stopped raining. And I got that flex seal from that awful infomercial that that guy screams no. at you about putting his boat back together. Why didn't you just throw your ShamWow up there? <laughs> So I went up with the Flex Seal, sprayed no. it. It stopped the leak until the roofers getting it out there. Did it really? Well, now we've got an endorsement for Flex Seal. Well, I didn't mean an to do that. An unpaid endorsement. I didn't mean to do that. An unpaid endorsement. But I mean, you know, where there's a will, there's well, a way. I mean, this was, you're in a different century than I was when I did this. <laughs> I love that, so, though. Yeah. I love 1988 that. 1988's a different world. Tar. Than, than uh, 22. Can you even get yeah. tar for I your house know. these days? I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. I, I don't even it. know how that stuff works. It's just that, it's like, like dry, it's, it's nasty. Yeah. It's just nasty. I love it. It's a great pretty, mental pretty picture. Much, pretty much white. Like trash. That's what I was doing there. <laughs> this is the Ramsey Show. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it. Ken Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Drew is with us in Greenville, South Carolina. Hey, Drew, what's up? Hey, thanks for having me on. Sure. How can we help? Yeah. So I currently have um, student loans. So I just graduated uh, undergrad in spring of 2021. Um, and I went to a full-time job right after, about a week after. And then I started grad school uh, last August, which is a two-year program. Um, so I've accumulated uh, pretty much a good bit in student loans, about 90000 uh, 90, total by the end of my grad school uh, career. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to attack that um, amount as quickly as possible because my goal is to be financially free and debt-free as quick as possible. So, um, and then one more thing is, uh, my current employer, um, found out they have a tuition assistance program. So that's, they're going to knock off about 30 grand right there. So really I'm looking at about 60,000. Um, so trying to figure out the best way to, uh, you know, pay that off as quickly as possible. What do you make? Uh, r about 70,000. Okay. What's the, uh, what are you uh, studying in grad school? Um, it's a master's of engineering management. Okay. And what's that costing? <laughs> it's costing 60 grand. 
And you're how far into it? Uh, I finished one year, so I have one more year left. Okay. What does that increase your income by for having that? Um, I'm hoping, you know, the company I'm at, um, I'm not really sure what the pay structure is for a management role because currently I'm in a technical role. Um, I would have to guess, I mean, about minimum 90 to 100 starting as a manager. Oh, and you make what now? 70. Oh, yeah. Okay. But you're guessing, number one, so go find out. Right. Number two, right. uh, you know, if you're an engineer and you bust it on a technical level, am I incorrectly presuming that you'd have an opportunity to move into management, or do you have to have a master's degree to get into management level of engineers? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary to have one. I think it, it accelerates the timeline. Um, it kind of pushes you a little bit quicker up the t- up the up the chain from what I what I've heard from people at the company. Okay. All right. Uh, well, you're you're halfway there. You're going to finish it. So the way you get out of student loan mm-hmm. debt is you live on nothing and beans and rice, rice and beans. You don't go inside a restaurant unless you're working there as an extra job, and you don't go on vacation. Mm-hmm. You live on beans and rice, rice and beans, and you attack the student loan debt as fast as possible. You got sixty thousand to pay off while making seventy towards a hundred. Um, so mm-hmm. I, you know you need to do that in a maximum of two years, twenty five hundred a month. Twenty five hundred a month, and you need to start that now because you're currently yeah. making seventy, mm-hmm. and not take on the debt. Yeah, um, and then the other thing that didn't sound real I... convincing. <laughs> Well, I also just bought a house too. Uh, I was renting about a uh, early this year, but I yeah, decided that was a to... huge mistake. Really? <laughs> You're broke and ninety thousand dollars in debt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I I don't know. My thought process was, I mean, I'm starting to build equity early. Yeah. Um, listen, here's the thing. Okay. Um, you're going to have to decide which thing you're going to do. And the thing you're going to do, if you believe the shortest distance to becoming wealthy, which we do, and we have data to actually prove it, it's not a a theory, and we've been doing this for 30 years, the shortest distance is to not add new debt, number one, and then number two, live on nothing and clear your debts as fast as you can, because then you will have control of your most powerful wealth-building tool. Um. And quit using your own analysis on these things because your own analysis sucks. It's what got you where you are. So um, don't don't look in the mirror again and say to yourself, you know, I kind of reasoned this through. No, because your reasoning has caused you problems. It's got you into a mess. And so you don't need to use your reasoning. You need new sets of information to make this decision. If you're an engineer, you built a bridge, the bridge fell. We don't want to use your calculations again, okay? That's not a good, it's not, it doesn't build a good bridge. And so that, that's where you're setting. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, now, thanks for calling. We appreciate you calling in. Now, let, let's sidestep a second, Ken, because um, a, a $60,000 degree that might maybe, maybe increase your chances of, that's overpaying, for, it is for masters. It is, and you're right. He's halfway through, so we're going to well finish. finish it. But the appro- the reason I ask that question is I want people to think about this. Unless it is the only way, meaning there is no ticket to the dance if you don't have this higher ed degree, then you've got to think through it. And you take a young man like this who's fresh out of college. He's got to earn it. He's got to pay his dues, Dave. He's got to crush it in the now. And then as he does a great job, goes above and beyond what his leaders ask of him to do. He shows himself to be humble uh, in the workplace. He shows himself to be hungry, to look for more opportunities to do what whatever it is to win. He's going to have an opportunity for leadership regardless of the master's degree. You take the same person with a master's degree. And they have the supposed edge and they're up against a guy who doesn't have the master's degree and one is humble and one is hungry and goes above and beyond what's required of them. Leadership will look at that person unless there's some sort of weird, goofy politics involved and they're going to promote that person every time. Well, you can pay $80,000 for an MBA or you can pay $17,000 for an MBA. 
Well, there's that too. Um, That's exactly right. And so you need to think about what you're paying. And um, once again, we just want to underscore for everyone out there, not just that young guy, but for everyone, that not all education is worth what you pay for it. That's correct. It does not give you an ROI, a return on investment necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so if you pay $17,000 more for an MBA and you pay for it in cash and you finish and get a master's in business, and that might open up some doors, maybe a little bit, but, and you might end up, your knowledge base actually might cause you to make more, not really the degree, Mm -hmm. but um, beware of anyone who tells you, including telling yourself that going back to school is automatically worth it Mm -hmm. at any cost for any degree, because unless it's permission to play, it's usually not worth it. It usually doesn't have an ROI. That's true. And if you overpay, you ensure that it doesn't have an <laughs> ROI. Yep. And one other piece of advice for Drew. Drew, uh, Dave gave you a really good target, and I heard, heard the doubt in your voice because you've got a mortgage now. Uh, $2,500 a month can be done with your skill set as an engineer. I would be, besides rice and beans uh, and schooling, you're looking for extra work, nights, weekends, engineer type work where you can make really good money per hour that would allow you to reach well, that 40, 20, 50 bucks, right? Absolutely. He yeah. could do that. And now all of a sudden, what needs to be true for him to pay $2,500 a month to knock this out in that time period? It's going to be extra work. Yeah. He has a skill set that is in great demand. He can find a way to make extra money. Yeah. And the faster you don't have any debt, the faster you start to build wealth. That's correct. Because your most powerful wealth building tool is not some kind of scheme or scam where you try to figure out a way to trick your way into it. Um, it it's um, your, most pow- your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. Mm-hmm. And it's simple. When you don't have it going out in payments and you put it in the 401k it, and in your Roth IRA, it causes you to become wealthy. It, it really is that stinking simple. It is. There's only one way to stack money, Dave. You got to make it and keep it. And and we, we overthink this stuff. It's pretty straightforward. Yep. That answers that. This is the Ramsey Show. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Chuck is with us in Indianapolis. Hi, Chuck. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, how you doing? Great. What's up? Well, I was calling in, you know, I've been listening to your show for a while, and, you know, even your baby step or whatnot, they was teaching that us in high school. Some of, you know, some people didn't pay attention, you know what I mean? But those are the stuff that you know I've been using, and I don't. I wouldn't say I'm the best at using it. You know, some people do what they after they learn what they learn, but I'm, I'm I own my own business, and you know it's going well. But some you know it has its ups and downs, and sometimes man, I'm like, should I just go give me a regular job or just keep going? You know, I, I mean I'm I'm. To the point where I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do. Well, you know, without because you know, running your own business, you have to work all the hours, you know, and toughest boss you'll ever have. I'm sorry, repeat that again. I said that's the toughest boss you'll ever have working for yourself. That guy's a slave well, yeah. driver, man. He'll work you in the ground. Yep. So, you know, I, I'm like, man, sometimes I want to be like normal people, go out on a regular day or, you know, so I'm like, well, you can't be normal. But then I'm like, 
Yeah. What kind of business yeah, is it, Chuck? A tow service. Okay. Mm. Is it just you and one truck? Or what you, you have a fleet? What's going yeah. on? Well, I got multiple outfit, but it's just me, though. So. And I and I try to hire some people, but people want to want so much. They want so much pay, but they can't. Do, you know, they can't even back the truck up. You know. <laughs> I hear you. What is the uh, what's the market rate? What you think is the fair rate for a tow truck driver? I'm just curious. Yeah, well, that's what what the other people are paying. I can you know. I know, I know. I don't care about other people. Based on your business and your revenue, what's a, what's a rate that if you could get somebody to take it today, you'd pay it happily? Anywhere between fifteen. If, if that's if they're good, you know what I mean. I hear you. You got to train because them up. They can't, you got to train they, them up. But you know, you know how many people I train. Some people, and then it's not even training. You, you know, this is not. It's the continuous learning because once I teach you each job is not the same you know what i mean sure so, so what, what's the rate you. what's the rate 15 to 20 an hour is that what you were going to say yes yes okay what'd you make last year net profit w- what for the business or me well you i mean what'd you pay taxes on last year uh 120 okay can you make that drive working for somebody else well yeah yeah, I'm going to have to work like a Hebrew slave for them. <laughs> so would you rather work for you or for them? Yeah, that's the thing. Working for me, I have to be the manager and this. And, you know, right. the, 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 the thing with me is I can control what I do, you know. Right. I, I can decide, hey, like I was talking, you was talking to the other guy about the heat and the air. Uh-huh. If the custom, most of my customers, they happen to see me when they call, you know. Right. So... That's not the, it's just more of the, you know, so at this point, I'm like, man, sometimes I'm, I'm more like, I'm tired of it changing time for money, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you could make 120 driving a truck or some other kind of vehicle for somebody else, you didn't have to work the crazy hours. Would you jump on it? Would you even be calling us? Yeah, I know I can do that more myself, but it's, you know. Well, you got to look for it. My point is, is it, you you got to decide, right? I either want to work for myself, and then I'm going to have to try to hire somebody. And I know it's hard. We hear this a lot in Entree Leadership when we have our leadership conferences. It's really hard. I understand that to get good help, but I also believe there are people out there who don't want to be in an office who want to drive a truck or a tow truck and they want to be somewhat autonomous and they'll learn they'll get trained i know you can find good people so you have to double down and go all right i'm either going to do the work to find good people to train them up and pay them and take some of my chief everything officer off of me and begin to delegate it or i'm going to say forget it i don't want to deal with it i'm going to find a good company where they value somebody like me and i'm operate heavy equipment or drive a truck make really good money and leave it at the office or at the work site and go home those are your two choices yeah everything you said about running your own business was negative you don't you're tired of it you're done mm-hmm. you're not you didn't you didn't have any fight left to fight us to say oh i, I should keep it because of this you, you never not one thing did you say there's a reason not to keep it all the reasons were to get, reason to get out of it and there is some reasons to keep it but you you don't have those anymore and so if i were you i, I would close it up sell your truck and go get you a good job and um, not have to worry about all this junk. And because you are, you are officially done just listening to you. You don't want to fool with it anymore. Um, you know, unless you want to fight me on that and you didn't have any fight left when we were talking, then I, I think that's the best route. I, I think you're done. It's not to say one's better than the other. I'm just saying where you are. Sam's with us in New York City. Hi, Sam. How are you? I am well, Dave and Ken. How about yourselves? Better than we deserve. What's up? That's what I like to hear. Yeah, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm 22. I, uh, I currently have, have no debt. I'm, I'm moving to a new city um, because I'm a recent uh, college graduate, starting a new job, and I need a car to commute. Uh, in a car, car market, I would have always buy, bought used, but because car used car prices are so high, but oftentimes higher than MSRP, I want to know if it makes sense to consider a new car market instead of the used car market. Well, that was true six months ago. It's not true today. Used okay. car used cars are back down again. And so okay. they're not they're not all the way back down to where they were. There's still some premiums on some of them. But um I mean if you start pulling up Kelly Blue Book 
uh, you know, trade-in values, uh, even private sale values, you'll find used cars are still, are again, substantially cheaper than new cars. So a good, a good rule of thumb, Sam, is unless you have a million-dollar net worth, you don't want to buy a new car. They go down in value too much. How much money you got saved for this car? I mean, I've got saved up uh, about thirty, but my uh, salary is a hundred. Good for you. Mm. Good for you. Yeah, I, I'd buy me a you know a, a, a twenty thousand dollar. You need an emergency fund left after you buy it. So uh, I mean, I, I'd buy a nice twenty thousand dollar good solid used car of some kind that sounds fun if you're twenty two and living in New York. And I'd pay cash for it, and I'd be done with it. And that's the only thing I would consider doing here. You don't want to buy things that are going to go down in value when you're twenty two in your first job. You don't want to buy things that go down in value ever unless you make so much money and have so much net worth that the amount you lose in value doesn't matter. That's why we say when you have a million dollar net worth, if you want to buy a new car, that's fine because a new car will lose 60 to 70% of its value in the first four years. That's the average since we've been making new cars. It's like the world's worst investment. Now they're fun and I love cars and I'm a multimillionaire. I buy brand new cars often. I sometimes buy a used car. But um, but I can afford the loss in value. It's 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 not a relative amount of money in 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 my in my situation. In your situation, it's a relative amount of money. It's a lot of money. Losing ten thousand dollars on something right now in your life is a lot. So I, I wouldn't buy new. Not at all. And at twenty two, Dave, I thought you were very generous. I'd I'd push him a little bit. I'd probably do fifteen thousand. I mean twenty two, but hey, you got the money, do exactly what Dave said there, but you don't need a fancy car, just something nice and dependable. That's all. You, you trust can get me, a lot of car for twenty grand. A, a lot of car. Fabulous vehicle. My for goodness. I mean, it's it's amazing what you can get. And yeah. certainly if you get a brand that is very dependable, doesn't have a lot of mechanical issues, I would just stack that money if I were your age. I really would. Yeah. yeah and stay out of the car business for a while. I mean, it's a, it's a losing business. So, and it is right now, too. But, yeah, you're right. Six months ago, uh, you know, we had the mm -hmm. supply chain issues that messed up the car market, like it messed up the lumber market, like it messed up a lot of other markets. But nowadays, uh, some brands anyway are cranking the factories back up and they're dumping the new cars back on the lots. And that's bringing the used cars back down uh, because new cars are starting to have inventory again. Now, some brands, they don't have any inventory still. Uh, they're still short, but it um, uh, depends on what it is you're looking at. But, but still, I, if I'm 22, that's what I'm doing for sure. That's the answer to your question. Thank you for joining us. This is The Ramsey Show. here you can find all of our shows with the ramsey network app on your smartphone it's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes download the ramsey network app in your favorite app store today of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thanks for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Luke is with us in Jackson, Mississippi, starting off this hour. Hi, Luke. How are you? Good. How are y'all? Great. How can Ken Coleman and I help? So I'm currently in a job. Um, I'm 22 years old, and I've been in this job for about two months, um, and I've quickly found out that I'm not really passionate about it. Why? Um, well, I'm in, the, I'm in the wine and liquor industry. I'm a sales rep, and it's just um, it's pretty difficult to watch people come in, in a store um, who already have a pretty difficult life and walk out with your products. Um, it's just a hard thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, hard to see that happening. So it's a values disconnect. Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. E everyone that walks into a liquor store and buys wine is not having a bad life. 
Yeah, I, I know that, but it's the uh, it's the ones that are. I'm in a pretty um pretty poor area, and so it's the uh, it's the ones that are coming off the streets, like just just pennies in their pockets, coming in and buying the cheapest things on the shelf just to get a just to get a drink. Why'd you get into this? Did you work in a liquor store, or you're a salesman for a distributor? I'm a salesman for a distributor. So how are you dealing with the people coming in off the streets? Well, so I've got to go into the stores and um and and talk to the the people to try and talk to the the liquor store owners to try and get them to get my products. Um, which a lot of them, you know, we we have some high end products, but a lot of them are are to target those those cheaper customers that are just trying to get a quick drink. Okay. I'm just curious, and I understand all of that. I understand it's very personal for you. But what I'm curious about is how how did you make this decision to get into this two months ago? Well, well, I I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to originally get into medical device sales, um, which is a very it's a difficult field to get into without sales experience. And so my my original intention was to just try and get my foot in the door for the first couple of years, um, and just get some sales experience under my belt so that I could then move into that other um, that other field. But it's just right now it's it's getting pretty difficult to, no, to I keep get it. going because it's just it's a it's just a moral thing. Sure, I get it. But you took this opportunity just because it was I need some experience. I got to sell something, and this presented itself, and you jumped into it. That's what I'm understanding. It, exactly. All right. Yeah. So here's the deal. Stop overthinking this. You're going to stay in this role, and you're going to have to suck it up a little bit. And and you're not doing exactly. anything morally wrong. I understand your feelings. I don't want in any way to discount what you're feeling, convictions, all that. But the fact is, you're not doing anything wrong. And so sit still and keep doing the job until you find another sales job to replace it with. That's the advice. And I appreciate what you're trying to do. Get some sales experience somewhere else. But now you got to learn from this and go, wait a second, I'm not just going to take any sales job. I need to make sure. sure that I'm going to sell a service or product that I'm okay with. And you can't overthink this, you know, because again, there's nothing wrong with with distributing alcohol or selling alcohol. But in your situation, this is very, very personal. So I wouldn't overthink this. Let's make the move. How much? And, are you, how much are you making? Uh, forty-five thousand. Okay, so find another sales job making forty-five to sixty thousand dollars, selling something you're proud of, and then change. That's what Ken said. That's right. Okay. But then get in proximity if you can. If you could get selling something that's near or around that medical field, I, I would try to look for that first. Do you understand for what sure. I'm saying? Because it's connections yes, at this point. Not just experience, but connections. Okay. And and make sure that as you're doing that, that you're taking on something you can be proud of. That's Everyone right. in sales needs to remember it's very difficult to be a great salesperson selling something you don't believe in. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that I've been I've been struggling with because yeah. I've got alcoholism on both sides of my family um, from both my parents' sides. Um, so it's that that's been the hardest part is just not really um, care. I don't really believe in the products that I'm yeah. that I'm selling, and that's been the, the hardest and, and, part. To and just so wake, if if, wake an, up if an opportunity similar to this presents itself, don't take it mm-hmm. for sure. There's something else because you had red flags before you took this. Yeah, you're only two months in, so I know you did, and and now it's manifested and it's actually worse than you thought it was going to be, in terms of convicting you. Yeah, and you know your your morals are saying ding 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 ding. The alarms are going off. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, go find something else as soon as you can, and then quit. But don't just quit every time you have a uh, adversity. Uh, a situation you know so again i don't want you there six years from now i don't want you there six months from now you ought to be able to find a sales job doing that so uh doing something that you actually believe in you know ken here over the years uh, we've developed we develop products books or software or apps or classes or whatever and one of the biggest challenges is to make sure that um that, that we're all proud of what it is we're putting out. The instant we're not proud of it, we can't ask anybody, including me, mm-hmm. to uh, suggest it to someone, sell to someone. That's what sales is. It's suggesting you do something, right? And, and uh, you can't suggest, you know, buying a car if you hate uh, that brand and you think that brand's a piece of crap. Mm-hmm. And, and then you're going to go to work for that dealer, you know? Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's that's going to be a problem. 
Yeah. So don't uh, don't take a position where you're not proud of where you work. So true, and specifically in sales, because sales, you know, period. People, but, 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 any, but yeah. it's very difficult. In sales. Very difficult in sales because you're an evangelist, right? That's your role, and people can fake it. And there's a lot of fakes out there that that hit their sales numbers. But if you are a person of conviction and you've got a, a true ethical code to you, it will wear you down if you can't get excited to the point of evangelizing on behalf of the product or the service that you're selling. It's absolutely it will cripple you. It just will. Yeah, it's it's very difficult because people can, you, your body language changes, your That's tone right. That's right. changes, your facial expressions yeah. change, all your nonverbals are are just not there. That's correct. You know when you're doing that, and so, um, I mean, if you're selling a uh, in his case a a line of whiskey that is, uh, you know, the bottom of the barrel, no pun intended, <laughs> um, and. Um, uh, and it's designed to take advantage of the homeless, then you're not gonna you're not gonna be fired up about that. Yeah, you know the, the drunk homeless guy, right? Yeah. So you're not gonna be jump. You're not gonna be nobody's gonna be excited about that. Yeah. Um, now you know, but uh, so you just gotta find a way to do the thing you do that is not violation of your morals, or find something period that isn't. But don't be just. <sighs> After two months jumping out without having something to jump to. That, well, that's right. That's why the first thing I said was, hey, you're going to stay put and yep. you made this decision. So you're going to be an adult about this until we find something to replace that income. You don't yep. just say, oh, I don't like it. I can't do it anymore. And he wasn't yeah. saying that, but got to be careful, you know. Well, I mean, there's a. That's honorable work, you know, for a lot of people. Yeah. For him, it's not a good fit. Exactly. This is The Ramsey Show. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here. Open phones at 888-825-5225. We're halfway through August. Can you believe it? Next week, every store will probably have a freaking Christmas sale. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. If fall means planning to go broke until tax season, make it this year... uh, (laughs) <laughs> make this year the one you say no i'm not going to do that enough is enough the ramsey ten dollar sale is back for a very limited time if you're ready to say enough we're here to help you and our team isn't stopping there we're going to help you solve your money worries by offering free financial coaching with any purchase you can talk to a ramsey preferred coach about your specific money question and are uh, you ready to say i've had it and then you can learn to say i've got this uh, we know 10 bucks can't get you much these days, but at Ramsey, you can. Any one of our best-selling books is on sale for $10, or virtually all of them anyway. Check them out at RamseySolutions.com. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. You get free samples, free shipping, new promos all the time. Uh, use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best possible deal. Today's question comes from Kendall in California. I just graduated high school, and I'm wondering if it's right for me to go to college this year. My school starts in two weeks, and I have a full ride. I would be studying economics in hopes of going into investment banking. This past year, I discovered I have a knack for drop shipping, and I'm making $6,700 a month in profit i'm seriously considering withdrawing from college but don't know if that's the right move 
<laughs> well, that's loaded. <laughs> and I don't have the opportunity to go back and forth there, but I, I'm always going to look at the long term. So the long term dream, um, if you do want to go into investment banking, uh, certainly the economics degree is going to help. Uh, I think it's a good degree to have. You've got a full ride. That's a tremendous opportunity that a lot of people don't get. I'd be talking with mom and dad about the long term and this $6,700 a month that's probably going to grow in profit. That to me would be, I'd be saving up for big life expenses, the house and investing long term. Uh, so I would not drop out of this path uh, of college towards uh, investment banking um, it, just because you're making so much money with the drop shipping side hustle. I think it's a great side hustle. I think you'll learn a lot from that. But this is a big picture decision and you need to surround yourself with wise counsel and make the right decision based on the long term. I don't know enough more in that question, Dave, to I'd love to talk to that young man in person uh, for well, the long I mean, term. You just graduated from high school. $6,700, you feel like you're rich. Exactly. You're not rich. <laughs> yeah. Okay. $6,700 isn't rich. Uh, you're not rich. You need to go get that economics degree and become an investment banker. Uh, then you can get rich. But um, and, and in the meantime, while you're going and getting the degree, go ahead and work yeah. the dropship. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I don't care if you make $10,000 a month out of your dorm room. doesn't make me mad. Uh, that's good hustle. It's a great hustle for a, a young man straight out of co- high school. But don't confuse the short term, Ken's exactly right, with the long term play just because you feel rich. Um, I mean, you know, I won $10,000 on the lottery. I don't have to work. Yeah, you got to work. <laughs> that's <laughs> so right. You're not rich. Yeah. And so that, you still got to work. Yeah, you're not done. And um, that, that's the thing. So, yeah, go for the long play where it's going to take you where you want to be when you're 40. What's going to make you, what's going to, the, you know, the 40-year-old version of you is not wanting to kick the 18-year-old version of you's butt for doing something stupid. Think about it. When you think about that guy, who's that guy? And where is he going to be happy? Which one's he going to be happy he did? I, I, so I think you do both. Mm-hmm. Go to school and keep running the drop ship. Drop, you're not carrying inventory. You're just, you're just com- you're manipulating the, uh, the wholesaler with a, buy- with a retail buyer and you know pulling the plug out of the middle. And that's all you're doing. So it, it's uh, if you got something working that well, I think you can still pull that off. Hey, thanks for the thanks for the uh, email in. We appreciate it. Emily's with us in Casper, Wyoming. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave and Ken. It's a pleasure to speak with you. You too. How can we help? Well, I'm calling for strategy for starting to withdraw from our 529 plan. Mm-hmm. We're in baby step seven, and our oldest is starting college, and then we also have a sophomore in high school that could be attending college in three more years. Mm-hmm. The current value is thirty-seven thousand, mm-hmm. but this past December it was at fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are prepared to cash flow about half of the expenses, but I'm wondering about strategy one for. Kid? Um, we have two kids. One no, no. college. You and said one... half. Would half be one oh, kid? No, half monthly each year. So, for her total expenses. We're prepared to, if we need to, we can cash flow half of it and withdraw from the 529 for the other half. Just to leave some in the fund so that we can yeah, use I it would leave it all year. in the fund and cash flow the whole thing. What are you, what are you spending on school? Um, it'll be about 15000 a year. What do you all make? Um, one twenty. And you don't have a payment in the world. You're baby step seven. Correct. Okay. Well, you can cash flow 15000 a year then? Yes, we could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I would leave the thirty seven for the second kid and let it grow tax-free and then just pay this one. Okay. Pay, pay for this one. And, and, and that's good. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter, but, um, you know, because here's the thing. The, the growth in the 529 is 100% tax-free. The more mm-hmm. of that you get tax-free – that you did not do anything for except parking the money is good. And so leaving it alone as long as possible to get that as much tax-free growth as possible is free money. Is okay. Lo- is that logical? It is. Yeah. yeah. I, it's funny. I didn't think about that. I just thought we would start with drawing. No. Uh, do we still keep contributing or we just stop contributions and then just I wouldn't contribute that? beyond what you think you're going to need for kid two if you're going to cash flow kid one. 
Okay. But I would contribute up to kid two's limit. I mean, if you're doing 15,000 a year for four years, that's 60,000. You got 39,000 now. Once that thing looks like it's going to be at 60 by the time kid two gets there, I'd stop adding. Yeah, as of December, we were almost there. <laughs> yeah, so it could come back to that pretty easily. So I don't know. I don't think I'd put mm -hmm. anything else in it. I think I cash flow kid okay. one, and if uh, it doesn't ever come back, then you're going to cash flow part of kid two and and empty the thing out on kid two. But I suspect it's going to come back. Yeah, and then I guess we could also use it as an emergency fund for education, that if we did have a month where we had an emergency, we wouldn't have to dip into our emergency fund. We exactly. could dip into our 529 if needed. Yeah, if you're getting a cash pinch because of the timing of when a tuition payment's due or something, you can reach over there and grab it. And, of course, the other thing is yeah. if the kids go get scholarships of any kind, you can withdraw up to the amount of the scholarship from the 529 with no taxes at all. Okay. So if they get a $2,000 scholarship, pluck 2000 bucks out of there and just put it in something else and, and just even if you're going to turn around and use it right then. But it's completely tax-free. Um, you don't have to do anything. There's no, no obligation that it be spent on uh, education at that point. Uh, but that's not your problem. You, you're not. You haven't got too much in there. You got too little in there. So, yeah, very cool, very good. I'm glad to think through that with you. That's very interesting. So, sounds like I got a, an affordable school. It's a good school. Yeah. Good buy mm -hmm. at fifteen thousand a year for I like higher that. ed. Four yeah. years, sixty grand. Yeah. That's a that's a play. It is, and I you know. I, it's going to be interesting to see what shakes out over the next five to seven years for parents that are listening with younger kids. The The tuition game, I think, is going to change. I think it's gotten overheated, just like a lot of things in our economy. And uh, I don't have any predictions here. I'm just saying I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the world of college tuition and higher education shifts over the next five to seven years. Uh, I predict higher ed is not going to get the memo soon enough to uh, keep some of them from really taking it on the chin. Yep. They sit in their lone little ivory tower, no pun intended. That's right. Um, and um, too many of them in that world have not woke up and smelled the coffee yet. Tuition rates cannot continue to rise. It's not well, sustainable. And people are no longer willing to pay. That's COVID exactly woke them up. why. You want, you want to charge me the same and me sit at home because of your masking policy on COVID? And I don't think so. That's called online classes. They're cheaper, Bubba. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you are with us. Bill and Sherry are with us there in Fort Myers, Florida. It says on my screen, you guys are debt-free. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Way Appreciate to go. It. How much did you pay off? We paid off $438,806.32. Wow. How long did that take? Well, it took 13 years. Okay. I wanted to be on the show to let others hear a perseverance story. <laughs> I hear you. Good for you. And your range of income during that time? Uh, we uh, started out at zero, and then we quickly grew that to about 80, and uh, we're currently sitting at about 225. Cool. What do you all do for a living? Well, I'm an elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I work for Siemens. I'm an uh, electrical sales engineer for them. Very cool. What's the house worth? I take it you paid off your house. Oh, yes, absolutely. Way to go, weirdos. I love it. <laughs> Y'all are excellent. How old are you? We're 58. And uh, what's this house worth? Well, it wasn't just the house. Um, we have a strange story, Dave. We, we got started in real estate a little bit like you uh, back when we were 28. That was 30 years ago. But we had subscribed to this mail order real estate course called Carlton Sheets. And that oh yeah, was no funny down guy. Remember him? I remember Carlton. Yeah. Don't ever do that. <laughs> anyway, he was like, buy this one and then borrow from it and buy the next one. So we had ten apartments, 
Uh, we paid off a motorhome, 10 apartments, and then our home, our home in Florida that we live in now. So you own all of it free and clear? Free and clear. Absolutely. What's it all worth? Oh, I guess all the assets together would probably be in the area of $2 million. Way to go, guys. Woohoo! Yes. I love it! That's excellent. Baby Steps Millionaires. Well done. Well done. Good stuff. Man, I'm so proud of y'all. Good, good Thank work. You. So you. what puts you on this whole Ramsey way of doing things? Well, believe it or not, in uh, back in 08, we had one of those life moments. This is why you want to always have an emergency fund. We didn't have one. We had all these apartments. We're paying on these apartments. And if there's a vacancy, it's a real problem. Yeah. But uh, I, I was doing great in my career. I, I was having a great sales you know sales year. My wife was teaching. She goes, you know, our son's going into high school. I'd like to be home so I can be involved in that. I said, do it. And I said, I'm having a great year. Well, you know what happened. Six weeks later, I was laid off. Oh, my God. So we went all the way to zero. And uh, one of Sherry's teacher friends, Melissa Weigel, gave us your book. And I read it in one night, one sitting, and I said, geez, I wish I'd learned this in high school. I mm-hmm. said, we're doing this, and we just took off from there. Wow. So, Sherry, you didn't have to be talked into it at all. Oh, no, no. I was like, oh, I, I am the thrifty shopper. Okay. You know, I like consignment shops, and so I was all on board to begin with. I wanted to get out of debt and, and start a free life. Yeah, I love it. Good for you guys. Well done. Well done. Thank you. What do you tell people the key to persevering for 13 years is? Well, you know, certainly you got to get that budget out and talk about it once a month, even if it's painful. Uh, But you got to review it. You got to be in sync with your spouse. My wife and I still have the $50 rule. I'm hoping that'll go up here soon. (laughs) uh, We don't let either the person spend $50 without checking. So that, that seems to really help. I feel like we got to dive in on that with Sherry. How, how do you feel about raising the $50 limit? He brought it up. People want to know. Well, I, listen, I'm still very conservative. <laughs> I like to, to have a nest egg and, and know it's there for our future and not to, to touch it. And, you know, I kind of had to keep him on a budget, but um, he's doing really good. I have to say that um, we're both kind of on the same page, and that's so important. Sherry, you got $2 million. I know. That's needs to be the hundred. Needs to be a hundred dollar rule. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Sherry. Okay, maybe we'll go up to a hundred dollars. There we go. Wow. Oh goodness. Hey, Bill, you owe Dave and I on that one. By the way, Sherry, you answered that one like a politician on a Sunday morning show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are fun. Very well done. Very well done. Thank okay, you. so for. 13 years you've persevered from that zero, uh, both of you, lo- her quitting, you losing the job, we go to zero, scares the crud out of us. For 13 oh, years yeah. you've leaned into this. Now when you look back, was it worth it? Oh, my gosh, the feeling is absolutely incredible. God is so good, and, and we are just very blessed. Absolutely. We worked hard, but I wouldn't have changed it at all. Yeah, way to go. Well, i got to tell you, we're proud of you. You're pretty amazing. So a couple million dollars worth of real estate there and, and uh, net, and net worth in excess of that and uh, a good household income and, you know, you're not even 60. So you got lots of time to enjoy this. Lots of good stuff ahead. Very, very well done. So um, if you had it to do over again, what would you do different? Anything? Oh, I think we would have started off when we were like 25 when we got married. Yeah. And maybe we wouldn't have had such a huge wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you wouldn't like have bought nothing down apartments. Ring. Yeah, maybe you wouldn't have bought nothing down apartments. Right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Good for you guys. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, we got a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires for you. You are one, and uh, that's very, very cool. Uh, A one-year membership to Financial Peace University for your your use, or you can give it to someone who runs into your story and is inspired and you want to help them. Same thing with the Total Money Makeover book. Uh, Eight million people have now read that book. Well, eight million people bought the book. We think most of them read it. So um, (laughs) there's there's that. So, hey, guys, way to go. Very, very proud of you. Excellent, excellent job. Bill and Sherry, Fort Myers, Florida, 439,000 house and apartments and everything in 13 years, making zero to 80 to 225. Count it down, baby steps, millionaires. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're dead free. Yeah. <laughs> that is how that is done. Woo. Well done, you two. Very, very well done. Man. So there is a principle here of um, diligence. The Bible says the diligent prosper. Diligence is excellence in the ordinary over time. Doing it every day well with, and they prosper. As opposed to, what are they calling the thing on TikTok? Quitting while oh, you're at quiet work? quiet quitting, yes. Quiet quitting. Mm. Like being at work and not working? Yeah. Is that the idea? Uh, the idea is I'm not going to do any more than it's expected of me. I'm just going to do the bare minimum, go home, and uh, not going to get any well, now, I would agree with that if you signed up for a 40-hour work week yeah. and they're trying to work you <laughs> 80. Oh, sure. You know, and you're like, okay, I'm going home, you you know, at five. Because we go home at Ramsey. I mean, we close this place down and yeah. our, we go to home to our families at night. But we work hard while we're here. If anybody quiet, so quitting. quiet, quiet quitting. quits yeah. while they're here during the day, I'll quiet fire them. Yeah, it'll be very quiet. That would be quiet. I love that. That would, that would like yeah. you're not working while you're at yeah. work. That's called lack of diligence. Oh, well, yeah. Lack of yeah. character. Kind of yeah. like stealing. Yeah. But I don't, I don't can't tell. Some of the stuff seems to talk about that. Like don't don't work while you're at work. Like some kind of like I'm well, it's on all strike. Mixed or in there together. I'm a millennial or whatever I am or I'm a whatever some kind of snowflake and right. I don't want to work and you're going to pay me anyway. Well, I'll just fire your little butt. Yeah, I can fix that. Um, uh, but it, you know, but if you just are, if you're instead saying, oh, I'm going to do the work that that we agreed I was going to do, and I'm not going to work 80 hours a week, then that's fine, because I didn't yeah. ask somebody to work 80 hours a week here. We don't do that. Um, now, occasionally we have to, because something's messed up. we got to get, you know, we got to get something done, but it's a short-term thing, because it's a small business. We have to get our work done, but this idea that I'm going to quietly not work, which a lot of people were doing that anyway. They're just sitting on their Facebook account while they're at work. And yeah. unless you work in social media, that's not working. Well, listen, Bill that's, and, th- and that's diligence. These that's guys right. on the other side, of this call we just took was diligence. So baby steps of millionaires versus average. Yeah. What do you want to be? Average, mediocre, or quietly quit. This is the Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Bobby Knight said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Oh, that's the truth. Wow. Good stuff. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He's the host of the Ken Coleman Show, now heard on over 75 radio stations and as a podcast and a YouTube show. Uh, audience increasing every single month to that show. Lots of you tuning in to learn about and talk about how to find career work that matters, work that gives you a sense of joy, a sense of traction. And uh, hey, also check out his number one best-selling books, including The Proximity Principle and Paycheck to Purpose, The Big Dog Book. It's uh, helping a lot of people walk through the seven-step process to finding work and doing work and giving it away that they love. Again, Ken Coleman, my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Shade is with us in Wisconsin. Hi, Shade. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I am 28 years old. I am about to have my second child up in April. 
Yay! Um, I am trying to go back to school to find a better paying job. I have a couple options. I'm trying to go for an operating engineer. Um, one of the options is staying here where I am and just going to the tech school and getting my CDL. Uh, the other option would be going down to Sun Prairie for a school that would cost roughly around 10000 a little bit more than $10,000. Okay. There's financial aid involved in that. Um, and then the third option is being a um, apprentice, but I do believe that would be traveling. Okay. Uh, if the if the uh, apprenticeship opportunity did not involve travel, how open to that would you be? Uh, seeing that it's still paid, I'd be very open. Yeah, that's what I heard in your voice. I'd get absolute clarity on that. Was that just the way you said it with your voice, or do you're not quite sure you've heard something, but you're not quite sure how much travel, if any, is involved? I'm not sure. I'd find out. Let me tell you why. Uh, because of, A, how you reacted, that's the best option for you in your life. But I also love uh, the opportunity for the apprenticeship. Uh, this is doing two things for you, experience and connections, and you're getting paid for it. So I really like that option. Uh, do you have any cash set aside for the other two options? I do not. I've been. I just got a brand new job, starting at like seventeen dollars an hour. Um, so that's going for me, but nothing so far. What uh, besides your heart hurting would and being away from? What I mean by that is you being away from your wife and one child and the other one on the way. What besides that uh, makes the apprenticeship with travel uh, not so desirable for you? Anything else besides that? Um, just not knowing. You know, I do have a car that I'm still paying on, so... Not knowing what? Just what it all involves, you know, not... Yeah, uh, so here's the deal. I want you, as soon as this phone call is over, at least make a phone call, an email, get some information on this, because if this apprenticeship pays you $17 an hour or more... And it's going to involve some travel away from the wife and the little ones. And they're so little, they'll never know. I'm just going to tell you, of the three options that I've heard, it's the best option on the table. I understand there's some sacrifice involved, but that's part of the journey. You're going to sacrifice one way or the other, and you don't have the money to take on the schooling now anyway. And we don't want you to go into debt for it. So you're you're going to sacrifice time by saving. You're going to have to work harder, stack up the money to pay for this path versus get paid to be trained. And, and so I, I really would look intensely into what would it take to win – uh, in that apprenticeship. I would. Okay. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's exactly what I would do. Um, and uh, what are you making now? I just, I don't know the total, but I know it's like 17. It will be 17. You're making 17 now? The 29th. Yeah. No, I'm making 14 now. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought I was And sorry. what is it you're signing up that, what is it you want to become an operator or what? operating engineer so pretty much the guys that drive the big old like construction equipment oh okay all right all right yeah i'm gonna do that the cheapest possible way and the fastest possible way just to get trained okay. to operate the equipment whatever that is um and okay. um that's some that's some good money once you're certified right yes like what kind of money once you're certified? Uh, I could be making, I do believe, like thirty-six dollars an hour. Yeah, or more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, well, that that's exactly what um, that's exactly what you do. Yeah, you, you get the fastest, least expensive way with the least trouble. And so, uh, like my um, when we when I graduated from college, my wife lacked. Uh, four or five classes finishing her degree and we moved away from knoxville where we were in school to nashville in those days the uh college in the area mtsu didn't match up with the it was one was semester one was quarters and it, it was going to end up taking a year and a half for her to finish what was otherwise three or four classes and we discovered she could take the three or four classes if she went back to knoxville for six weeks and we had just had our first child, and so she drove to Knoxville every weekend with my brand-new daughter for six weeks 
and she cried and I cried more every time she left the driveway for six weekends uh, and went to class six weeks, put the kid in daycare for six weeks to finish the degree Mm -hmm. and drove back. It was the longest, most horrible six weeks ever. But in the scope of my life, it really didn't amount to squat. It was worth it. You know, we sacrificed for her to finish the degree. Um, and, and it did not, it was not a degree that she needed to finish uh, to be able to do the career that she wanted to uh, to do. And, um, you know, but it was the best way. So I tell you what, you hang on for a second here. I'm, I'm getting a call in. Brian's in Owensboro. Looks like he's got the better advice <laughs> than, than Ken or me. So, Brian, it says on my screen you're an operating engineer and you've got advice for Shade. I am an operating engineer out of local 181 here in Owens in Henderson, Kentucky. I live in Owensboro, but um, I have been an operating engineer for 27 years. And in my best advice to you, young man, is to take the apprenticeship program in the operators' union. Ken Coleman, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Good. I have been I have been debt free since I was 18 years old. Wow. wow. What are you making an hour? I make right now. Uh, different contracts are different. I just got off a job making thirty four eighty an hour. If I work in southern Indiana, it's thirty seven forty an hour, um, and I usually average between right now between ninety and one hundred and thirty thousand a year, depending on because I also run cranes. Fantastic! Crank. Wow, good for you. Well, there's so, advice shade from a guy who really mm, does it. You yeah. can't beat that. No, come you in. Gotta and, love that. Come in and a give us. Give you know, there's a guy in the field that says do it, and uh, so your instinct was correct, Ken. Well, it, only because the apprenticeship is is really what the American economy was built on. Number one, and it's just simply I get paid to actually get experience, yeah. and that's the best of both worlds. You know, uh, because what he's going to learn in that apprenticeship. So, if you want to sell real estate, go to work for a high producing real estate yes. salesperson as and get their coffee yeah that's exactly right and learn how to do it for create your own apprenticeship is what you're suggesting exactly uh yeah i think it's the it was the right route based on those other two options because he's going to spend money to sit in a classroom or he's going to get paid to actually get in the truck yeah i mean you know what i mean like if you just think about it the 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 old days uh, you know you lived above the 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 shop for the guy you worked with you know you know the old blacksmith or whatever that kind of a thing yeah that's a different deal but but this is a high tech here i mean oh yeah but the apprenticeship is a real opportunity in today's world it really is coming back you trucks and the major dozers or whatever there good stuff very interesting very interesting good stuff Well, that puts this hour in the books. Our thanks to James, to Andrew, Zach, Ben, and Austin in the booth. Ken Coleman, good hour. I am Dave Ramsey, your host. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there is ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts.